So I want to ask you, what is the most exciting thing going on in your life right now? Just take a moment to think about it. Someone said the Ravens. Come on. That's too soon. Too soon. What's the most exciting thing? Think about it in your life right now. Someone said Jesus. That is correct. Okay. No, but honestly, if you really ask yourself, the thing that I, I got most joyful out of this week, just consider it. Now, if you were to ask me that question, what am I most excited about right now? I'd be tempted to say the fall. Maryland in the fall, baby. There is just something special in the air, right? You can have California in the summer. You can take Florida in the winter. Give me Maryland in the fall. Amen? They're like 60 degrees. I got my hoodie on. My wife doesn't steal my hoodie. Uh, I got candles, right? Uh, crab cakes, football, and fall. That's what Maryland does, baby. <laughs> Speaking of football, I'm also excited to hear the sweet, sweet voice of Scott Hansen on Red Zone today at 1 o'clock. Uh, only some people understand what I'm talking about, but seven hours of commercial-free football. Oh, heaven is, is, is awaiting me after the service today. I'm excited about my kids are just old enough now to be able to play board games that aren't crappy board games. Like, we're not playing Guess Who for the thousandth time. We're actually playing Yahtzee, which is so fun to play board games with your kids until you lose to a four-year-old. Like, that is humbling. <laughs> like, my kid will roll, and he'll be like, what did I get? I'm like, that's freaking Yahtzee again. What the heck? <laughs> but it's, it's fun to play board games with my kids. I'm excited about... I got a couple uh, new speaking engagements this fall I'm excited about. I'm, a, I, I'm excited about some new shoes I just bought. I bet you you could say there are some things that you're excited about too. And I bet you we could even give like, you know, the gospel community Christian answers of things I'm excited about, right? Like, I'm excited we had Good Neighbor Day yesterday. We got to serve our city. It was awesome. Uh, I'm excited that we're running out of space in our church. Our church, like so many people want to come hear the Word of God preached. That's really exciting. I'm excited that we have Baptism Sunday coming up September 22nd. I'm excited about... All these really cool Christian things that are going on. And all those things, from Yahtzee to baptisms, are exciting. But all those answers are wrong. They all pale in comparison to something far greater that's going on in my life right now. And in your life. Let me show you what I mean. Turn with me to the text Amy just read, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 30. And the reason I, I started with that question is because what you get excited about really matters because what you celebrate is what you replicate. And I think the more important question we should be asking is, what is God excited about in my life right now? What's his long-term plan for you? Did you know he actually wrote it down? What he's excited about for you? And it's in Romans 8. Verse 28, it says, Jump in the text with me. And we know that for those who love God, so there's a qualification to this promise that's coming. The qualification is you got to love God. This is only for Christians. Now, loving God doesn't mean you pray a prayer once because your, your youth group leader forced you to. Loving God doesn't mean you sat in a room with a bunch of other people every Sunday or most Sundays. This is a verse for people who deeply love God at the seat of their heart more than they love anything else. This is a like, I won't let go until you bless me, God, kind of love. I'm not going unless you go with me, kind of love. That's what this is promised us for, for Christians. For those who love God, here's a big promise. All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, that is a crazy verse. A lot of people lock into that verse because it is an avalanche of a promise that will turn your epistemological crisis into a, a life of worship. But people tend to just zoom in on that verse and skip what follows after it, which I think is actually just as incredible as verse 28. Notice verse 28 says, all things work together for good according to his purpose. If you love God, now what is the good that God is working together. Well, he actually tells you in the next proceeding after verses, 29 to 30, you're about to read the purpose of God for your life. The purpose of God for the universe, the purpose of God for this church. 
Here it is, verse 29. Theologians call this the golden chain because it's all tied together. Verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This golden chain tied together. Now, do you see what God is describing here? God is actually mapping out the timeline of your life. This is it right here. This is his wonderful plan. You ever, I hear Christians ask me all the time, like, I, don't, I just want to know God's will for my life. You ever pray that? Like, God, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to marry this person? Do you want me to go to this school? Do you want me to move to this state? Do you want me to buy this Corvette? No. <laughs> you want to know God's will for your life? It's right here, written down. Your story, your redemptive arc, your purpose. This is it. And notice, by the way, all of this is divine activity. God is the one who's doing all this. We just reap the benefits of his work. And I actually put a map of it on the screen for you. You'll see this is where you were and where you're going. You start with predestined, which verse 29 says, to be conformed to the image of his son, which basically what predestined means is you weren't thrown into God's group project against his will. Like God actually, before the foundation of the world, chose you. He said, I want you. You've always been on his heart. That's what that means. And maybe you feel this morning like your parents don't really want you, or your friends don't really want you, or your job barely needs you. Well, there is somebody who wants you. Somebody whose vapors created the galaxy. He chose you. Second part of the timeline is you've been called. Now, if someone calls you, you've you got to actually pick up the phone. You ha- you got to respond to Jesus' invitation where he says, let me live a life in your place and die in your place and, and follow me. So to be called is the moment you believe Jesus lived and died for you. And then he victoriously rose from the grave, proving as a receipt, yeah, they're good in heaven forever. And he takes away all the debt of evil you've accrued. And then thirdly, justified. That's the exact moment that you were called and believed, you were also justified. Verse 30, those whom he called, he also justified. You see that? So Christianity is sudden and gradual all at once because the minute you believe in Jesus and surrender to Jesus, the chains of your sin are broken and you're set free. You're justified, which is just as if I'd never sinned. And I'm acquitted in the universal courtroom of God. You're not just acquitted, you're adorned with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So when God sees you, he sees all the good Jesus did. And then finally, the last step is glorified. That's the finish line of your life. Heaven, when the work is complete and you fully embody the character of Jesus Christ. Now, that's the, t- the golden chain that Paul has mapped out of your life. Now, you ever go to an amusement park and you see those maps and it says, you are here? That's kind of what's happening in this text. Except there's a lot less screaming and crying kids and hangry moms and dads. If you're a Christian, you were predestined, you were chosen. You were called by Jesus to follow him. You accepted, and that moment happened, you were justified. And now in between justified and glorified is where you stand. And that, my friends, is the most exciting thing going on in your life right now. Why? Because your past is forgotten, your future is secure, and your present right now matters. Because in this stage between justified and glorified, something marvelous is happening in your life. Do you know that? Right now, something exciting is happening. Something indescribable, something that you can't do on your own. And it's called sanctification. Which is a fancy theological way of saying God is currently and actively conforming your soul into the person and likeness of Jesus Christ. He's turning you into who you're going to be forever. That is a wild concept. Now, just imagine with me if you knew God was about to transform your outer being, your body, into the perfect body. Like you would have ripped six-pack abs, bulging muscles, whatever your idea of a perfect body is. 
right? He would probably shrink the, the size of my nose to a more proportional size. He would get rid of all the gross golf tan lines I have going on right now. You, you would have no more autoimmune diseases, no more allergies. You were about to be given a transformed, perfect body. How exciting would you be? How excited would you be? I'd be pretty excited. Um, or in, in another way, maybe you, know, you don't really care how you look. Imagine if you knew that your test scores, your grades, would immediately tomorrow be transformed into perfect test scores and grades. Or if your bank account would be transformed tomorrow to a perfect bank account. But you never had to worry about money again. All those things would be something to get excited about, right? But what God is promising here in Romans 8, 20 to 30 is something even more exciting. He is actively conforming something far more precious. Your inner being, who you are to your core, is being revolutionized in this very moment. And Romans 8 says, all the circumstances in your life, good or bad, are put in motion by God to transform you into somebody who looks like Jesus Christ. Verse 29, that we will be conformed to the image of Christ. Now, that word conform means to look like. And in English, we tend to think outward, like, oh, I'm going to have long hair and blue eyes like Jesus did. No. First of all, he didn't look like that, okay? Don't, let's stop. Don't let, like, the 16th century paintings fool you. He looked more like me, okay? Uh, <laughs> he was Middle Eastern, all right? He was Palestinian. <laughs> Just on the outside, not so much on the inside. When we think conformed, we tend to think outside, right? But this Greek word, when it says conformed, or geez, we're going to be conformed to the image of Christ, that's the Greek word morphe, which is where we get the word metamorphosis. Uh, the same word we use to describe a caterpillar transforming into a butterfly. And so what the text is saying to you is that God's plan isn't that we would become Christians and then just muddle along in some modest respectability. You know, we, we'd follow Jesus, and then all of a sudden we'd be people that recycle or pick up our dog's poop most of the time and say hi to our neighbors. We're nice people now. No, he promises, I'm going to metamorphosize your entire being that, such that people won't even recognize you when they compare the old you to the new you. You're going to be so radically different. I'm going to change your very inner essence to the exact same inner essence of my son, Jesus. And so what that means for us as Christians is not that we suddenly get passionate about following the rules, but we become passionate about the person of Jesus Christ. You become amazed by him. You want to be like him. And the most exciting thing you have going is God promises, I'm going to do that for you. I promise. And nothing will get in my way. I'm going to make you just like my son. There's a famous story of Michelangelo's masterpiece, the world-famous statue, David. I have a picture of it on the screen. I cut out the bottom part. I don't want to be distracting. Michelangelo actually carved this iconic piece, which, by the way, it is exquisite. You look at the arms, you see the veins. It's just a phenomenal piece, one of the most famous pieces of, of art in history. He carved this statue out of a massive piece of marble that actually was originally rejected by numerous other sculptors. Everyone believed that this previously attempted chunk of marble was ruined and unworthy of an, even a, an attempt to sculpt anything. And when Michelangelo found it, it was laying half-finished, face down, neglected, covered in moss, untouched for 25 years. Until this young 26-year-old master named Michelangelo came along, took this giant piece of marble, and sculpted perhaps the most famous piece of art ever created. And when uh, people later asked him, Michelangelo, how did you do it? When everyone else seemed to give up on the project, Michelangelo responded, it's simple. The sculpture was already within the marble. I just chiseled away at everything that was not David. And you see, just like that piece of neglected, forgotten, broken marble, even if the world sees you as nasty and messed up and useless and discarded, a block of stone no one wants, God sees the masterpiece underneath it. There's a beauty in you waiting to be revealed once his loving hands are finished chiseling away at whatever is unnecessary. 
And Romans 8 is here to promise you that everything good or bad in your life is God molding you, sculpting you, contouring you, polishing you, shaping you into the image of Jesus. He's going to make you just like him. He's going to give you that incredible kindness, that incredible compassion, that incredible self-sacrifice, that incredible dependence upon God, that incredible passion. Everything happening in your life right now is unto that. Everything. And it's predestined. It's fixed. It's guaranteed, God promises. In fact, verse 30, the, the final part of the process, that term glorified, which is the last step in God's transformative work, it's the finish line we're all headed towards. You want to hear something absolutely crazy? In the Greek, that term glorified is in the past tense. God doesn't say you're going to be glorified. He doesn't say you are currently being glorified. He says you have been glorified. Well, that doesn't make sense. I haven't reached heaven yet. How can he say that? Because it's fixed. Because it's that certain. It is absolutely bound that God is going to make you as beautiful as Jesus Christ. Scholars are baffled by the certainty that Paul uses in this text. He talks about it in the past tense because it's done. It's as good as done. He's going to make you as radiant and as holy and as happy as Jesus. And nothing in life is going to get in between you and that. No matter what people have done to you or no matter what bad decisions you've made. Now, if that is the telos or if that is the end of your life, the purpose of your life, according to Romans 8, Is that what you're most excited about right now? Is that what gets you giddy inside? Is that what you daydream about? Is that what's on your vision board? Is that in your 90-day plan? Here's what I bet you're focused on, and I know because I do it too. I'm a pastor. You're focused on your plans next weekend, or your next vacation to London, or Venezuela, or wherever cool place you're going. You're focused on your to-do list that's got to get done by 5 o'clock tonight. You're focused on what the person next to you is thinking about you, which, by the way, they're not thinking about you. You're focused about on your career. You're focused on your love life, if you even have one. You're focused on your exam next week. You're focused on your workout routine. You're focused on your investments with the stock market tank last week, and I'm screwed, and it better bounce back. You're focused on getting those kids home and fed and put to sleep so I can finally relax. And a thousand other things, aren't you? You're probably thinking about them the past five minutes of the sermon when I was reading Romans 8. Here's what Romans 8 is telling us today, though. God is not primarily interested in what you're doing. He cares so much more about who you're becoming. Life is more than catching the American infinity stones of a prestigious degree and successful career and a picturesque family. God is, through Romans 8, whispering to us, why are you not more focused on what matters most in eternity? Who I'm turning you into. I saved you so I could transform you. Who you're becoming is so much more significant than what it is you're doing. And even if you're here and you're not a Christian, which, by the way, we're really glad you're here, you know this to be true in your heart. You know how I know? Because I could preach the best sermon you've ever heard, which I know this probably isn't it. But if I was preaching the best sermon you've ever heard, but you knew behind the scenes I was an absolute jerk, would you care what I was saying right now, no matter how good it was? Like, if you knew I was cheating on my wife or something, or getting drunk behind the scenes, or I was a menace behind closed doors, it wouldn't matter what I was doing, because who I am matters way more, right? It gives substance to what I do. What I do flows out of who I am. You know this because how many kids have had a dad who did some incredible things, made a ton of money, won some championships, started a business, was famous in some way, but they looked at their dad and said, Dad, all I want is you. 
Because who we are matters more than what we do. I just wanted my dad to be there, they would say. That's because the greatest gift, listen to me right now, the greatest gift you can give to the people you love is is the best version of you. It's to give them your unhurried, sanctified presence. More than they need something in your hand, they need something in your heart. They don't need, ultimately, your resume, your stuff. They need you. And God is saying through Romans 8, that is what I'm laser focused on, the person you are, a healthy you. Are you as focused on that? Is that what is consuming your heart and mind? Because that's the only thing you bring with you to eternity. You know that? The person you are. And if you're here in this room and you're a Christian, this is why coddling little sins matters. This is why the Bible says, kill sin. Or as one of the reformers said, kill sin or sin will be killing you. You gotta kill the little ones. Why? Because little sins, what they're doing, if you're a Christian, they're tearing at your soul, piece by piece. They're ripping away at the fabric of your heart. And they're deteriorating the masterpiece God is sculpting. It's like a slow erosion that you barely notice at first, but then pretty soon you realize, I'm drifted way further than the person I intended to be. You know this, and you feel this. You know how? Because when you indulge lust, even a little bit, you notice, I start looking at the other, uh, I start looking at people differently. I go to the gym, and I'm focused at different things. Different. I was looked at the weights, but now I'm looking at the people. Just even a little bit of lust changes who you are and how you see people. When you, when you coddle over drinking, it rips away at your overall inner self-control. You start to lose some of it. When you, when you refuse to forgive someone who's wronged you, you suddenly notice yourself becoming an angrier person, even though that was never your intention. You're telling me that those little sins you're coddling are worth giving up this metamorphosis God is doing inside of you. And the way you kill sin is you look at it and say, yeah, this would feel good for a moment, but are you kidding me? This is so not worth it. It's like trading a Rembrandt for a Cracker Jack box. I want to, I want to be a part of this masterpiece God is sculpting, not these little feel-good sins, these Costco samples that would just leave me hungrier later. And they got me to buy it, and I didn't even want it. God is doing something so much more significant and exciting in your life that you can look at little sins and say, I don't even want this. I want what's far greater, what God is doing in my soul. And we should have an urgency to this, Christians. I, like, imagine for a moment if you knew right now you smelled really bad, which it may be true. You have to ask the person next to you. I don't know. But imagine the horror that would go through your mind right now if someone whispered next to you, you smell awful. Go ahead and do that to the person next to you. Go, just try it. You smell awful. You guys can't even do it. Like, I heard like, a bunch of you say, you smell great. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you don't smell awful. You're ruining my illustration. Stop it. But just imagine for a second, you knew, oh my gosh, I reek, and the people next to me can smell it. That would be horrifying. You would, what would you do instantly? You would leave the room and f- go on a scavenger hunt for deodorant. Would you, would you go on a date like that? Would you show up to work like that if you knew you smelled awful? It's like, wh- where is he going with this? Uh, let me explain. There's actually a verse about this. Do you know that? In 2 Corinthians 2.15, it says, Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. Translation, the Adam Vitasa message version, God can smell you. And the same urgency in which you would in- induce immediate action if you knew you stank, it's the same spiritual urgency we should have when we realize, I'm not really focused on the person I'm becoming. I'm more focused on the things that I'm doing. Why in the world would you care more about your outer smell than you do your inner spiritual smell?
So here's the reality I want to hit in your heart this morning from Romans 8. The most important thing in your life is not what you're doing, it's who you're becoming. And if you're not a Christian this morning, I want to say something blunt to you because I love you and I'm really glad you're here and I I love you too much not to tell you the truth. You're ultimately living for yourself. You know how I know? Because your spiritual belief probably is either, if you're not a Christian, I work my way to heaven, or good people go to heaven, right? Well, you have to do good things to earn heaven. So why are you doing those good things? For you, so you can get to heaven, so you can be a good person. Ultimately, if you're serving meals on wheels, or you're cleaning up the neighborhood, or you're showing up to Good Neighbor Day, you're doing it so people would respect you, God would like you, God would accept you. Even your good things are done with selfish motives, the Bible says. And the Bible says, here, let me just flip the script on you, you have no hope of being good. And even your good things are are tainted with impure motives. You haven't even pulled up Google Maps on your phone yet and started the journey. You're that lost. And if you're a Christian, you're really no different. You're just as selfish. The only difference is Jesus saved us. And we were saved not by our works, but by his. And now we want to serve him because he served us. We're joyful to do it now. And we've accepted his call. And now we are on this pathway of grace that took us off the highway of destruction and now we're headed to become like Jesus forever in heaven. That is set, it's done. Why? Because God said it will happen, Romans 8. So are your long-term goals in line with God's goals for you? And can I just, can I ask you an even deeper question? Do you like the person you're becoming? Do you like you? Would you want to be around you? Would you trust you to be your boss? Your friend? Your leader? Do you like you? And if you can sit there and honestly and humbly say, ah, no, or kind of, or at times, I got some great news for you. You don't need to figure out the spiritual maps on your own like we're in the 90s, trying to figure out how do I get on Route 8. You don't need to go on your own spiritual quest and Lewis and Clark your way to heaven or to being a better person. Jesus pulls up the eternal Google Maps and says, here's the route, just follow me, and we'll go at your pace. I won't go too fast, and I'm going to push you, but we're going to get there. And you just follow him, and he changes you. There are people in this church who knew me when I was in college, and they're like, I can't believe that guy's my pastor now. I'm like, I know. Jesus, Google Maps. And the same can happen to you. The gospel reminds us that we don't try and become a better person so God will love us. We want to become a better person because God has already loved us. C.S. Lewis says, the Christian knows that God doesn't love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us. And so here's a statement we can all agree on after studying Romans 8 and getting on the same page is, here it is, ready? Every Christian in this room should be able to say this. My highest aim in life, my basic eternal purpose is to become more and more like Jesus Christ. If I succeed at everything else but fail at that, I have failed. If I succeed at everything else but fail at that, I have failed. And we should not be afraid of failing at what matters. We should be afraid of succeeding at what doesn't matter. Don't let your happiness depend on something you can lose. Let it depend on something that can't be taken away. And that's you becoming like Jesus. And so, for the next three months, what we're going to do as a church is look at the kind of person Jesus wants us to become. The kind of person he is. The person he's turning us into. And we're going to strive to be like him. Now, here's the reality. The average church attender goes to a church service 12 times a year. 
out of 52 weeks a year, which isn't very much. I mean, imagine if you went to the gym and ate healthy 12 times a year. You would, yeah, you'd be struggling. Imagine if you invested in your marriage 12 times a year. You guys would be struggling. Imagine if you showered 12 times a year. Then they wouldn't be saying what they said earlier to you. You smell great. No, you don't. Okay. You've got to up it more than 12 times a year, friends. And what I want to say to you is God is a God of inconvenience. To really grow, to really be used by the Lord, you have to get over your insecurities. You have to push through discomfort. You've got to be willing to be inconvenienced. And God takes a mustard seed of uncomfortable faith and he grows a garden inside you. God's greatest work in you often starts where your comfort zone ends. And so I want to challenge you over this next series with three things. First, I want to challenge you spiritually over these next couple months. Everyone in this room has a next step to grow into Christ-likeness. And so one thing that all of us can be doing during this next three months is prioritizing being here every Sunday to learn what Jesus wants to turn us into. And who he, more importantly, who he is and how he transforms us. So I want to encourage you to prioritize being here every Sunday. And I also want to encourage you to prioritize being in a gospel community because we don't change on our own. We change in community. We need other brothers and sisters around us contouring and shaping us and encouraging us on our journey to be more like Jesus. So I want to challenge you to be here every Sunday and to join a gospel community. And in fact, next week is, um, or it's next week, right? Gospel community. Yes, next week is, uh, I should know this anyway. Uh, next week is our gospel community uh, open house. So we'll have all the gospel communities on the first floor after the service next Sunday. And after both services next Sunday, you can learn what it means to join a gospel community. There's also RCC 101 coming up in the next couple weeks. That's a great way to learn how to be a member and join this church. I also want to put on the screen, this is our discipleship pathway. Here's some next steps that you can follow if you want to grow more in your faith during this next three months. This is something we use to show you uh, how you can grow. Uh, you see different categories there. Somebody who's never been a Christian before, a uh, first step would be come on a Sunday or uh, maybe do foundations, which is our curriculum downstairs. Maybe you've, you're a new disciple. Well, great. Make sure you start going to Stoop Group, which is within your gospel community. Uh, maybe you've been a Christian for a while. Great, you should be a membership. Maybe even lead a gospel community. And maybe you want to be developed for leadership. We need more leaders in the church because we have more people than we have leaders. So get plugged into a serving team. Uh, go to RCC Institute, learn there. Maybe um, multiply a gospel community or stoop group. My point is, is we've set up next steps for every single person, wherever you are in your faith journey, to grow. And so look where you are in this pi uh, pipeline, this pathway, and determine what do I need to do next to prioritize who I'm becoming more than what I'm doing. And if there's anything you want to do, just on your connection card, you can just put, I'm, I'm interested in blank. And as, I, as you consider being challenged spiritually over the next three months, if we decide to do this together, to become like Jesus in every way, do you realize what that means if we do it together? With this vision of life, here's what it means to lock arms with the church and to do this together. It's to look at the Christian next to you and say, I'm getting a glimpse of the masterpiece God is sculpting in you, and I want to be a part of it. And when we stand before God in heaven together, I want to look back at you and say, I always knew you could become this beautiful, this holy, this righteous, this good, and I am honored to have been a part of this journey with you. That's what church membership is. That's what being a part of gospel community is. So let's be challenged in the next three months to, to grow spiritually together. And those are some next steps we can take. Second thing I want to challenge you to do is to be challenged evangelistically. There are so many people in this city who want a greater purpose in life and are looking for one. And so I want to invite you to invite people who might come with you. You know, 90% of people will come to church with you if you invite them. That's what the studies say. 90%. That is a very high success rate. So we want to focus over this next three months on neighbors and nations. Say that with me, neighbors and nations. One more time, neighbors and nations. We want to focus on the neighbors next to us, inviting them to experience the life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that we have. And you can uh, invite anyone you want.
We also want to focus on nations. Maybe God is challenging you to go to the nations with this gospel. We have multiple members who are part of international missions now. We have one, David Whistle, who's going to be coming back at the end of this series to preach to us. Uh, he's a missionary in Japan, the second most unreached people group in the world. Maybe God is calling you to give your life and use your career to reach people with the gospel in places where Jesus is not known very much. So we want to focus on neighbors and nations over this next series. And then thirdly, we want to be challenged financially. Oftentimes, our hearts are tied to our wallets. And at the end of this series, what we're going to do is do an offering together. And we're going to call it the It's Not About Us Christmas Offering because it ain't about us. And we want to put together an offering that expresses the kind of generosity Jesus has given us and use the money God has given us to bless other people. And so I'm going to be mentioning it over the next couple of weeks, and it's going to culminate at the end of the series where we do an offering together, which you'll hear more information about, where we give up what God has given us to bless others, just like he did to us. Those are the three challenges I have for you. Would you grow spiritually? Would you grow evangelistically? And would you grow by giving generously financially? And I think if we all do this together, God's going to revolutionize our hearts. And he might even revolutionize our city. If you uh, want to get a glimpse of where we're going in the next couple of weeks, you'll see on the screen. Uh, next week, I'm going to talk about being a humble person. And the week after that, we'll talk about being a connected person, then a long-suffering person. We'll look at different texts in the Bible and address those together. I'm looking forward to the series. And as we close, was that short or long? I can't tell. I think it was short. We're going to go with short. Okay, good. As we close, I want to say to you, Jesus Christ does not see you as you are. He sees you as you can be, as you were designed to be. And he has a vision for your life. Inside that mossy, used, rusted up boulder marble of you, he sees a masterpiece inside of it that he wants to chisel away at. Will you let him? And as we close, this series is not about you or me. It's about Jesus Christ. It's going to be natural throughout this series to feel like, man, I've really fallen short. I'm not very humble. I'm not very hospitable. I'm not very long-suffering. You know who is? Jesus Christ. And he did it for us. So for every look that you, look, you take and look at yourself, take 10 looks at Jesus Christ because he is whom our salvation relies upon. We, our, our righteousness hinges on him, and that's good news, is it not? Amen? And Philippians 1 says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So would you join us in this journey on the most exciting thing you have going to become more and more like Jesus? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to come to you and say, we don't need anything, any of your blessings. We just want you. Thank you for saving us when we had nothing to offer you. When we were a mess and you reached down, picked us, called us, justified us, and you promised you will glorify us. And we are saying here as a people, we want to prioritize the kind of person we're becoming over what we're doing. More than we care about our doctorate, our MD, or our finances, or our, our little things we have going on. We care about being like you. The one thing I ask, one thing I seek, to dwell in the house of the Lord, to be with you, God, and to be made like you. And so I pray at the end of this series that each of us could look back and say, God, you, you incrementally transform me. I like who you're turning me into, and I'm anticipating who I'll be forever. And Lord, help our people in this room to really lock in and be most excited about what it is you're doing eternally through us. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, the name above all names. Amen.